All right. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the first APMA PodMed student webinar on how to prepare for your first two years of Podiatric Medical College. My name is Abhinav Pleva, and I am currently a third-year podiatric medical student at the California School of Podiatric Medicine. I also serve as the APMSA liaison to the APMA Board of Trustees, and we are excited to offer this webinar today to help connect current podiatry students during a time when they may feel disconnected from their peers. Today, we wanted to focus on sharing the perspective of current fourth year students, along with any insight or advice they may have for your students, for students earlier in their podiatric medical school careers. We will feature a lot of Q&A during this webinar and attendees are able to ask questions throughout the broadcast by submitting their questions through the question box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar toolbar. Joining me today, we have Kristen Brett from Kent State University, Mohammed Geith from the New York College of Podiatric Medicine, Elizabeth O oh from Western University, and Venetia Patel from Barry University. Welcome everyone. Uh, APMA Career Development Manager, Tiffany Kildale, will be helping moderate the questions for the group this afternoon. So I will now turn it over to her. Awesome, thanks Abhinav. And thanks everyone for taking the time to join us today, especially our fourth year panelists. Quick reminder to you all, I know Abhinav mentioned it, you guys can submit your questions through the question box in your GoToWebinar toolbar. Let's jump right into this. I'm gonna open it up to all of you guys on the panel for now. Our first question, Elizabeth, we'll start with you. What's your best study tip you learned while in podiatry school? Um, I would say right before I started my shift, and I started learning this in the maybe second or third externship, I knew there was a laundry list of things that I didn't know, especially I struggled with just the rote memorization stuff, your classifications, the screw sizes, the names of the procedures. So before I would start my shift, I would uh, allocate an hour of time to just run through it with a blind recall type of style. And I felt like that really helped me. And, and you're not gonna get, get through all of it for sure, but at least you're focused, having focused time to um, go through those things. And I think that really over time added up to the point where you're ready for interviews. Helpful. Venetia, do you have anything to add? What was your best study tip? For me, a lot of it was always writing things down. I'm more of like a visual learner, so I would watch videos of corresponding like content depending on what the class was. For like something like physio, videos were really helpful for me. Um, but typically writing down and making my own notes after I had like consolidated the notes that the teacher had given just because it was my way of learning what I had done and it was better for me to understand what was kind of being taught. Kristen, you want to add to that? Yeah, so just um, for all the students that are on there that are transitioning into medical school or even the first years um, who are like kind of currently in their spring semesters, um, it, there's a learning curve. There's a different way to study than I did in undergrad compared to medical school. Um, and it takes honestly a good semester to figure that out. Um, so don't feel like what you're doing at the beginning of the semester is going to be the same thing that you're doing at the end of the semester. If it works, great, and you're being successful and you're getting those grades, but also expect to have to change and mold and use new net technology. And I walked in, I was the type of person that always printed out my notes in undergrad, always hand wrote everything, but that wasn't feasible to keep up with in your first and second years. Material is being uploaded two hours before a lecture, you're not able to get to the printer, so on and so forth. So I had mold, I wasn't able to print out 50 million slides a day. Um, I got an iPad and I started writing on there and that wasn't figured out until after maybe my first or second exam round. So uh, just be open to change. Things are not going to be the same as what you are doing currently. Good, Mohammed. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, I think time management is very important. Um, you only have 24 hours in a day. So just, just try to leverage your time as, as best as you possibly can. Um, while also keeping a little bit of time for yourself at the end of the day. I would always study hard all day and uh, morning, but at night I'd put an hour aside just to do whatever I wanted to do to kind of de-escalate. And I think secondly, it's um, very important as medical students, but I, don't, I think a lot of people kind of cut short on it, but get enough sleep. Um, it's very important to, to get you six to eight hours of sleep every night um, just to help you stay fresh the next day. Um, those are my two tips. 
That's excellent. Never underestimate the power of a good night's sleep. I always say that. <laughs> so you kind of touched on it a little bit, Mohammed, and if you want to take a crack at this next one as well, you sure. mentioned kind of blocking off an hour at the end of your day to set aside time to do whatever it is that you want. So how do you study and plan for personal and family activities? I would um I would usually plan it around exam time. Um if if I had a particularly uh busy block or busy month of exams and I knew that that, that month I would just have to sacrifice to, to study hard and um do my best to get the best grades and learn as much as I can. But there's always uh, parts of your schedule that you have some relief. You have two or three weeks where you're going to have only one exam or two exams. Um, just look ahead at your schedule and, and find those blocks and, and use those times to, to uh, spend more time with family and friends. But uh, like I said before, just time management. If you're able to manage your time and your different blocks when you have exams, um, it could really help you have a very good um, personal life as well as balance it with your, with your school life. Kristen? Yeah, if I can echo and say time management is like number one thing, I would do so. Uh, that is so important. Um, if you know that you're the type of person that likes to wake up and study and that's when your brain works the best, I highly suggest you study in the morning and then do your activities the afternoon. If you're the type of person that needs to sit back and relax and let that first cup of coffee kick in and study better in the afternoon, then get your grocery shopping done, your workouts, everything else done in the morning so that you leave that time in the afternoon. Um, that's, I mean, for me, how I was able to find success while balancing, you know, working out, sporting, hanging out with friends, doing things on the weekend. If I know I'm going to a football game, leave time on the weekend and catch up with extra studying during the week. So yeah, time management, time management, time management. Super important for sure. So for we have a question from a student who is starting school in the fall. So how, what should they be doing now? Are there anything, is there anything that current or incoming students could be doing in the upcoming summer? Kristen, do you want to start this one? Yeah, so I just, I just really want to start to all the people who are about to start school is that the experience that you are going to have is going to be very different probably from the experience that we had when we were um, first years, just because of this whole COVID virus thing. Um, you may have more learning online with less interaction in class at the beginning. So just keep that in mind when we answer um, our answers for this question specifically, um, just because it's very hard for us to kind of relate what you guys are going through. But with that being said, I know that um, the first years of my at my school right now, um, there's there's been a ton of acclimation to this with online classes, online seminars, online labs and such. So um, I can't speak to that as much as coming into podiatry school the summer before, just relax, chill, get your living situated, figured out and enjoy your time off. Go to the beach, go hang out with family and friends, because once you start with school, it's really hitting the books hard. Venetia, do you want to add to that? Yeah, and just to kind of echo off what Kristen said, really enjoy your time. This is probably going to be the last chunk of time you really have, like, fully off to enjoy whatever you want to do um, until almost you graduate. And um, I'm sure we can all relate to that. You don't really get summers off. Um, you're always going to be doing schoolwork or studying for boards from this point on. And even though that doesn't sound like it's, like, the most exciting time, like, you're working towards, you know, your career that you want to have. One tip that I ha would say that worked really well, at least with the students at Barry, is always um, getting familiar with your classmates that you're coming in with, especially with this COVID virus going on and you may not be meeting everyone right off the gate. Um, find the Facebook group or make a group chat and stuff like that and just start getting acclimated with your classmates because those are going to be your study partners. Those are going to be um, your future colleagues. And if you can start building a relationship with them now and just kind of having fun and chit-chatting with them before all of school starts, um, it'll help foster like a really strong foundation for you when you do get to start classes with each other. That's a really good point. I never would have thought of that. Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, something I wish I did, because I was, I had the same question when I was beginning first year, what could I do to prepare? Um, cause I want to be the best or I want to try my best or whatever. But I echo Kristen's point. There are many, many studies that support that you need to relax before going into this because you're going to get burnt out. And if you guys want as a challenge because everything is so online right now um 
try to learn something new that, that you think is fun that's different. And I'm currently, uh, I have a little bit of time, so I've been doing like a Coursera course. It's titled like learning how to learn. I highly recommend it for those that feel like when they learn things that's not sticking. This course kind of teaches you some tips that help and some um, mindset adjustments that would help when you go into the drink out of a fire hose type of setting. <laughs> that's and actually those, really interesting. Yeah. Um, I bet you for listeners if they know what the drinking out of the fire hose setting is, but when you go into medical school, people say it's like drinking out of a fire hose because that, that's literally the amount of information that's going into your mind. And um, sometimes you can't digest and appreciate the water. Well, you just sort of led the intro into our, our next question perfectly, almost like you knew. So our next question, since there is so much information that is shared with you guys, how do you focus your studies or how do you prioritize on what you need to know for exams? Go ahead, Kristen. So again, this is another thing that's a learning curve. Um, you will have professors that you can almost, after the first exam or first couple of weeks with them, you can kind of sense what they're emphasizing. Um, things that are important, they will harp on. Um, sometimes you always, I mean, I found myself being successful by studying the exceptions in a lot of situations. So it's really easy to memorize, oh, these are all the same except for this one thing. And that you can find that in micro, you can find that in your biochem, you can find that in everything. Um, and just to, like what Mohammed said before, it's all about time management in the sense of if you have this assess or assessment or exam or something coming up first, um, you prioritize your studying in that sense, but never put something off in the back burner too long and uh, cram it per se in the last minute. Anyone else want to add on to what Kristen said? Go ahead, Elizabeth. I think understanding what type of learner you are also helps in this. Some people are more spatial, some people are more audiovisual. I know our school at Western, they do an assessment on what type of learner you are. I turned out to be like all of them, but I emphasize more visual audio. So um, I knew that after like a year of struggling and trial and attempts. So I would just gather a PowerPoint of all the things that I knew that I didn't know for sure. And then I would repeat them um, and try to understand them auto visually and also talk to myself. You're gonna go crazy, but it's okay. <laughs> Kristen and then Muhammad. Kristen, did you have something to add? Yes, just real quick. So a lot of the times you, you have no idea what's important, but um, I think a lot of the schools, our school especially, really helps you with uh, tutoring sessions. They have second year tutors, they have third year tutors who come back and help with the classes. And a lot of times, you know, tutoring sessions can be seen as demeaning or, you know, only the people who are struggling need to go to tutoring. I can say firsthand, I went to tutoring every opportunity I got. And that is honestly probably what made me be so successful. Um, a lot of times the tutors will point out things that were high yield material either on their exams or experiences last year, or maybe what they encountered once they were out, you know, either in clinic or um, what they found to be one of the questions that they got commonly asked on externships and just really having a relationship that you build within those tutoring sessions like last throughout the years. I know that to this day, I still keep in contact with the individuals in the years, years above me who tutored me and they were able to not only help me with academic material, but they were supplying me information about externships, things to look out for and then beyond that, like into the residency. And I know that those are connections that you make in those tutoring sessions um, for the rest of your life. Mohammed? That's actually like basically exactly what I wanted to say. I agree with Kristen 100%. So you guys have talked about studying for different courses. We've gotten a lot of questions about studying specifically for anatomy. Do you guys have any tips for studying for anatomy? <laughs> Go ahead, Benicia. So for me, I personally wasn't one of the students that ever like, been exposed to anatomy. Some students get anatomy exposure in their undergrad or in their major, depending on what they um, got a degree in. But for me, never experiencing it before, 
Um, the only anatomy I had really seen was Grey's Anatomy, and that's not really going to help you out. But uh, for me, it was reading it every day, reading a little bit of a section. Um, every professor at every school teaches it a little bit differently, but continuously keeping up with it because the anatomy doesn't change. It's just how well you kind of understand the anatomy. Um, for me, never seeing it before, I read a couple of pages every day, made sure I understood the topics so that by the time that exam came up, I had already gone through the material a couple of times and I used diagrams. Um, Netters was really helpful, which is a textbook most schools utilize. And there's online apps and things like that. So it's really just kind of visualizing what you're reading um, and figuring out what's the best way for you to learn. But like I said, for me, reading it every night, even just a little bit, just so you can continuously get that repetition of what it's trying to say for you. Kristen? So um, in these laboratory settings, everybody will dissect and you will most likely have a group of individuals that you are either assigned to or choose to work with. Um, huge thing that I found successful in the like the lab practical portion of anatomy is spend as much time as you can in the lab um, and go in with your small groups, quiz each other. You'll probably get a pretty good feeling of how your professors like to test questions um, after the first exam. So. Some of our professors would like to, you know, test structures from different angles than what you dissected them from. So we ended up, you know, putting on like a tiny little mock uh, practical for ourselves. And it really helped a, you know, learn maybe from a different point of view that our peers are learning from. And then B, I mean, everyone said it so far, they harped on repetition. Um, that is the name to the game, I believe. Elizabeth. Uh, anatomy is just one of those things where it's just memorization and there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come into your next four years or three years that is just going to be pure memorization and um, I wish I knew this earlier but space repetition really helps knowing systems like Anki. So anatomy is a little interesting because it has a, a practical portion and then a laboratory portion. So the practical portion that's where I'm saying Anki decks just wrote memorization, understanding what the direct answer is. And then for the laboratory portion, I would get like one of those um, needle things that sewers use from the 99 cent store and just poke it and then go, go, go with the pro and get some people and be like, hey, what's that? Origin insertion, what's the function? And then just keep repeating that because, and then group settings really help if you're um, like driven socially. I, I would highly encourage doing that. Mohammed. Yeah, I think those are all great tips. I just want to add, for whoever asked that question, um, kind of had, had a game. Um, I think that class, more than any class I've taken, is the most important class that I've had um, as an IG student and as an extern. That's a, that's a class I refer to every single day. Um, of course, uh, the, the surgical procedures for the foot and ankle are also very important in those classes, but I just remember, if you know your anatomy really well, you can always figure out what's going on in the operating room or any type of question you're attending uh, or up a year might ask you. So definitely um, put in the extra work for that class. I, I'm not exaggerating. I, I, use, I use and reference everything I learned from that class every single day in my career as a student. That's a really good point to make. Benita, did you want to add? Yeah, and one last thing is um, if you can't utilize like friends or if it's like one of those times where you're just kind of like in a crunch mode and you just need to study and you, nobody's maybe awake or something like that, utilize YouTube. YouTube has a lot of great resources and videos that kind of allow you to identify structures. They have them down to each specific body part um, system. And there's a lot of great resources out there on the web that have videos that have really good content that will help you for your practicals and just understanding the anatomy structures that you may be getting confused with or mnemonics on how to learn them. Yeah, Kristen. Sorry, just one last thing. Um, a suggestion that maybe um, maybe you might be faced with if we can continue this online learning for the, either the first years or second year students is, um, but if, if you don't have access to the lab, I used to, you know, um, take the PowerPoint pictures that we learned in class and then block out like the name of them. So then I could flip through my PowerPoint presentation on my own, you know, wherever I am and quiz myself. So if there's things to be like, everything can be modified if it's online um, and the professors have done a really great job of providing that for us. So you guys have talked a lot about memorization and I believe it may have been Elizabeth or it may have been all of you actually that referenced, you know, using repetition to help with that. Are there any other memorization strategies that you guys have employed to kind of help with that? 
Have I stumped the panel? Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. <laughs> Elizabeth, go ahead. I think in general for understanding, so in order to keep things into your long-term memory, because short-term memory and long-term memory, right? In order to make a long-term memory stick is making a personal association with it. And um, so sometimes I remember walking anatomy and I'm like, what muscles am I using when I'm walking or uh, I'm grabbing something? And you just ask yourself what or why and just continue doing it. Um, that's, I think I had another thought, but it blanked out, so. That's okay, we can come back to you. Benicia, did I, do, did I see you raise your hand? Uh, yeah, well, some things, um, just because I'm thinking of when I was studying for boards part one, a lot of, um, there's, I used to make like the personal references that Liz talked about. Um, so just making key connections. So if you can make a function of a muscle associate with like a friend that does something, uh, maybe a hobby or something, that's something that just sticks to your brain that you only maybe can make the association. If somebody else heard it, they probably would have had no idea. And there's also a lot of like musical lyric type um, mnemonics out there that are really easy to remember. So like nursery rhymes, um, choruses to like key songs that everyone knows and they've changed them into like words that associate with different parts of like the anatomy or even different subjects and stuff like that so just kind of figuring out what mnemonic works best for you but there's a lot on the web that you'd be surprised with if you read it you just remember just because it's super funny or something like that you'll make a connection with it that's helpful Muhammad, did i see you yeah and i think it kind of goes back to a question earlier with someone asked um what to do before starting your first year of uh pediatric medical school i i don't know why in in, in college i i didn't really um look so much into the best ways to learn i just kind of just studied and uh you know just just memorized it but then before starting school i i, I kind of researched like are there any techniques to learn out there and i and i came across this author his name is cal newport n-e-w-p-o-r-t and he kind of does research on productivity and one of his books talks about how to be a, a, a grade A student and he gives a lot of tips in there. So I recommend if if, uh, if any of you have some time to pick up the book. And uh, just for example, one of the things he says is, is to study in different places. For some reason, it helps you study. So I was a commuter. I would study at school. I would study on the train and then I would study at home. And, you know, it's anecdotal. I don't have any empirical evidence, but I always found that I, I retained things better when I studied in those three um, areas, I retained a topic better rather than if I just studied that topic in one of those areas. Um, so it's just an interesting tidbit, but check that out, Cal Newport. It's a very good book, author. That's a great tip. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for qualifying your research. I'm glad to know it's <laughs> anecdotal and not <laughs> evidence-based. So do you guys have any recommendations on note-taking software that you can use with iPads? Any specific programs, Kristen and then Mohammed? Yeah, I use Notably, Notably, no, I think that's what it's called. Um, I had an iPad Pro uh, that I got again during like my end of the first year, second year. And so I was able to use the iPad pen. I mean, that was probably the most expensive way to go about it. Honestly, I think there's cheaper uh, options out there. But yeah, I had an iPad Pro, I had my iPad pen that went with the Pro and then I had Notably, so I could access Notably um, on my iPad and on my computer through uh, Gmail. And to me, that was really helpful because I was still able to write because that's how I'm the best learner. I have to write things down. Um, but I know that there's other things out there. I never was the type of person that typed things. I always hand wrote things. Mohammed, do you want to add to that? Actually, same exact thing. It's the same app and the iPad pen. <laughs> Those two things that. <laughs> Good to know. Those are great resources then. Elizabeth, how about you? Um, unfortunately, I uh, cheaped out on like an eight gigabyte uh, iPad. So I started with Notability, but it kept saying I had no memory left. And I'm like, man, it broke my heart. Deleting <laughs> so I just stuck to PowerPoint. And whenever there was a slide or someone was talking about something that was important, I would just use a little shapes and put like a star method. You don't need a lot of money to get by, okay? So yeah. I just use PowerPoint. That's helpful. That's awesome. So hinging off of that, what resources do you guys recommend for studying for boards? Kristen, go ahead and start us off and then we'll go to Venetia. 
so I, um, disclaimer, not sponsored by anybody, but I owe like a huge part of my success to Sketchy Micro, Sketchy Farm. Um, I never did Path. I used Pathoma. I supplemented all those materials with all my class materials, and I um, cannot say uh, good good enough things about all of those programs. Um, so. And then also to kind of go back a little bit to how to like learn best sketchy micro I don't know if you guys ever have heard of it or anything. Um, but it's basically these two individuals that help you learn different microorganisms and they do it by this one picture they develop a picture and each symbol in the picture correlates to a specific characteristic about the virus or bacteria or something so if the bacteria is gram positive the picture will be a certain color versus a gram negative it'll be this color this symbol is gold because it means this and to me i still recall all my drugs all my bacteria with the picture that's in my mind it's amazing um so yeah that and pathoma just broke it down really easy for me for pathology and i used all of those resources for boards and i uh love them so Anisha what about you uh, I'm preaching what Kristen said it's sketchy micro sketchy farm or <laughs> saving um, I still am going to use that to like review stuff before starting residency um, can't say enough great things not it's like a cartoon picture like how Kristen described and then on the bottom it's got the word so if you like miss something in the picture if you need a reference back it's perfect I'm pretty sure almost all of us have like touched it that material at some point whether we liked it or not um, but it's just it's just super helpful for the visual learners. Um, and like Kyle Kirsten said, you can still remember the picture and exactly what the guy, even the jokes the guy says, just because it <laughs> sticks to your memory really well. Um, I did use Pathoma. Um, it's a longer base, um, I guess, study material in terms of like hours to complete the videos. So some students will use it just because of their time increment. And some students will say it takes too long, so it doesn't fit in their schedule. With boards part one setting, it really just comes down to your schedule and how much time you're allotting to get everything done and what your kind of goals are. Are you trying to have a one month of reviewing your material? Or are you trying to go through all the material in the allotted time that you have up until the exam? Um, it kind of really comes down to that. And the other resources, um, I'll, I use Kent's anatomy stuff for um, anatomy. I thought their pictures were amazing. Um, I think the school does an amazing job with referencing like the images that you need. Um, so you'll, you'll kind of hear different resources from different schools and you kind of just like look at them and see what works best for you. Uh, BRS flashcards are another really big one that I think complement Sketchy Micro and Sketchy Farm a lot. Um, I use the BRS note cards and then there was a, forget what the book's called now, but it was a physio, oh, well BRS physio was one and then there's like a shorter version of these like subject books. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. If the name comes to me, I'll tell you, but um. You can find them on the web, and if you like type in BRS, they come with that. They all kind of all those sources helped in those sense. So I think I saw Elizabeth's hand raised, and then Muhammad. Yeah. Um, just to answer the question also before of like knowing high yield anatomy questions, BRS questions. Most of my anatomy questions came from that book specifically. At the very end, there's a review question section, so um, that'll be a really good resource to use during anatomy. Uh, for part one boards, because I'm assuming the audience is first and second years, I think it's just good to emphasize you all always should have a question bank and a resource guide. So a question bank to anatomy for me was like New York, I guess, had an anatomy set of questions and I use those. And then my resource was the actual lecture material from Scholes or Show Me Anatomy <laughs> um, and Things like pharmacology. <laughs> Be sketchy would be your resource and then board vitals would be my question bank and just making sure that you're not passively learning through this material that it's better to allocate a little bit of time and focus and actively learn than spend all day eight hours feeling burnt out and only giving 25 percent um, I think a lot of the times I didn't know what I didn't know and I didn't realize that I was passively learning until I got in a group and we were pimping each other. And I'm just thinking, I know I went through this, but I didn't take enough time to digest it. So um, another thing with boards, I think people a lot of times are like, yeah, I'm going to study all day long. I'm going to push through. But your brain just doesn't work like that. Nothing ever works. You have to take time and give it patience and be kind to yourself in, in learning things. I like that. Be kind to yourself. Muhammad, what would you like to add? Two things. Um, one, if I, if you just uh, you know, 
think of the bo- the board as kind of like a like a journey and not something you just study for a month before. So so your first day of school as a as a medical student, just always you know study hard, and by the time boards come, you're gonna have most of that information already retained. You just have to do some reviewing. And number two is um board vitals. Um, Liz uh, mentioned it. Board vitals for me it was very important. Um, they have a lot of questions, hundreds and hundreds of questions. And I found it to be very helpful. I, I did it a couple of times, and, and I, I felt very prepared for board. Nisha, did I see your hand raised? Did you want to add something? Yeah, um, I was just going to go. The book that I was thinking of is Deja Vu. That was like the series, and they have like mini sub series on them. So some students, if uh, they're not understanding a subject and they maybe want to take a crack at that book, it kind of breaks it down into like kind of like a Spark Notes version of a larger textbook. Um, they're really thin, small reads, takes like a couple days um, when you're board studying. But that and board vitals, the explanations in board vitals, I think, are very, very well written and very supplemental. And they give you the resource they get it from. So um, if you haven't started checking out board vitals and you're studying for boards now, it's definitely um, something to look into. Elizabeth, go ahead. Just one more thing. There are practice questions or practice exams available making sure that right before maybe like a month allocate every week to take those exams and measure how you do and then focus that week's learning on the weaknesses so you're aware of um, the things that you need to grow in yeah go ahead Denisha. and one last thing is make sure you guys are talking to regardless of what year you are always talk to the people above you that have already taken it and see what kind of resources they can lend out to you what it advice they have. Um, they're going to be more familiar with the curriculum at the school that you're attending um, and what works and what doesn't work or how they like kind of took things and get multiple views because no one opinion is going to be better than anybody else's, but it's nice to kind of feel out what everyone's thinking. So definitely talk to like the people older than you, getting resources from them and just developing that relationship because it really does go a long way in the future. That's perfect. That, that really touches on it well. I'm going to quickly direct this question directly to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you mentioned a course earlier. I want to say it was Coursera that taught you the type of learner that you were. We've had a couple people ask about what the name of the course was because they wanted to look into it more. It wasn't. I'm pretty sure there's tests out there online where it just tells you generally what type of learner you are. It's like, what type of learner you are? Take the quiz or something like that. Um, I know our school gives like like an assessment before you start, but the course that I was talking about was, um, it's called Coursera. I don't know if it's like soup, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A. And I'm taking a course called Learning How to Learn Powerful Mental Tools to Help You Master Tough Subjects. And I think um, that course in general is just four weeks. I only spend an hour every week. I don't have time for our things that are too much of a commitment. So just spend an hour every week for four weeks. And it just discusses uh, methods on how to optimally memorize things from research-based um, institutions rather than just figuring out, okay, I'm just going to cram and see what sticks. Um, these are things that have been tried and true for most of the population. And um, sometimes you feel like you're the exceptions, but maybe you're not. I definitely identified with a lot of um, common mistakes that people do, such as rereading, highlighting. Those things are very passively learning. You want to make sure that you spend some time actively learning. It's so easy to highlight, and they come in such pretty colors. (laughs) I, I don't understand where the breakdown is. Thank you for that clarification. We appreciate it. Mohammed, you kind of touched on something in talking about preparing for boards and that you said that, you know, you've already learned the information already, like essentially the fundamentals of of what you've already learned is there to help you prepare for boards. So with that being said, do you all feel like, you know, your first two years in school did sufficiently prepare you or give you the learning blocks needed to help with success? Go ahead, Kristen. So I would say, yeah, definitely. Um, The school does provide you with it, but it also takes a huge responsibility on your part to um, go out there and really take advantage of it. Um, Again, with the tutoring sessions, that helps. And then um, if you are studying for these courses, like it's like what you're supposed to be doing rather than cramming the material like the week before the exam or something like that, you really aren't setting yourself up for success. So if you spend a day 
um, learning such and such so many hours here and there and there, and it builds up like you're learning it really from the roots of what it is rather than cramming it in and forgetting it. So like your whole second year, basically your farm, or at least that can your farm, your physio, um, those are two huge sections on boards. So like if you are studying for those classes very hard and productively, I guess I could say, like over the days, over a couple of weeks, you are learning that material and it's not going to just leave your mind as if you were to cram it. So um, Mo said it the best when he said that you know this material, but when you go to study for boards, it really should be essentially a review of things that, you know, you might have need to just dust off of. Um, and uh, again, take advantage of every opportunity. So if you're a second year, go tutor, um, try and tutor the lower, try and tutor um, the micro for the first years, at least at Kent, they're all jumbled in different schools, this is the order of classes, but um, yeah, so take advantage of that and that helps you review while you're helping out your fellow classmates. Venetia, go ahead. And another um, source to utilize, because echoing what Kristen said, it's exactly the same way at Barry. Um, they're gonna teach you everything that you can, they can teach you. And there may be a few things that you have to learn on your own, um, like very small bits of information, but a lot of it is also ask your professors. Um, a good amount of them work in some capacity with board questions or questions that may like come up on your part one or with the other professors at the other schools. So kind of ask them, like, hey, I'm not understanding this topic. I give a better way of teaching. Can we go over this? Um, I know physio at Barry is one of the harder courses that we have and our physio professor um, will always make time to sit down with you and go over anything that you have, whether he has to repeat it and teach it to you five or six times until you truly understand it. Um, even when it's during board time, his door is always open. He's always answering his email. So it's also just building that relationship with a professor so you can understand things as you go and you don't feel lost when it comes down to kind of like the crunch time of when boards is going to happen. So just kind of don't be shy. It's not it doesn't look bad to ask for help. It doesn't look bad to ask for clarification. No one's gonna judge you. I know that's sometimes a stigma students have, but honestly, you're putting yourself in a better situation later on than worrying about what's kind of going on at the time. So always utilize the people who are teaching it to you too, because obviously they've also gone through this too at some point. That makes sense. Elizabeth. Uh, I think this is an interesting question because you said what sets you up for success, but I think the definition of success changes depending on the person. Um, but in general, I think school teaches you really good qualities that if you don't hone, that they're going to not really help you in the future. For me, the first two years definitely taught me about resilience, the, the value of relationships and peer relationship as well as mentorship relationships. And then also making sure that it teaches you how to know where to go if you stumble. So there's a lot of times you're going to face throughout your life. This is a lifelong learning type of experience for a reason there are going to be many things that you're not going to learn but knowing how to navigate those moments i think is, is really going to change your trajectory to be successful if you know knowledge is your goal but just to emphasize for residency i think i heard a quote really recently i'm not looking for the best person i'm looking for the right person so I know a lot of times people are aiming for number one, and I really, uh, I want to encourage people to achieve whatever they want, but um, just being number one in your class sometimes isn't enough. Um, you have to make sure that you're a good person too. <laughs> That's a really fair point though. I think there's nothing wrong with that. So switching gears slightly, how did you guys go about choosing externships for your fourth year? We'll start with Venetia, Kristen, and Muhammad. I'm sure we're all gonna have on different ones. A lot of it comes back to, for me, it was preference regionally. Where do I wanna learn? Um, where do I wanna live possibly for the next couple of years or even longer? Um, so that was definitely one thing, but a lot of it came down to what do I wanna like learn out of the residency? All of them are gonna teach you like certain things um, that you need in order to graduate from the residency. But for me, it was more of my interest. I'm interested in sports medicine, trauma, um, certain techniques and um, things that are harped on more in certain regions than in other regions. And so that's how I pick my externships. A lot of it was also vetting from the people above me and um, residents at those programs and just kind of finding out more about it. It's really hard to just look at the Casper Crip page and say, okay, here's a PDF one page of this program. And really all it tells you is what it'll be like once you're a resident. It doesn't tell you what the program's actually about or what you're gonna experience while you're there for three years. Mainly it's like your benefits. 
Um, so you really just got to do your research. And like I said, take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Somebody may have an amazing experience at one program at one month, and I could go there the next month and it has a very low volume that month because there's just not much going on. And so my perspective is a little bit different. Um, it's really just finding out what you're interested in. And, and you'll learn that throughout your time. You may come in with certain interests when you start school, and those interests may change as you learn the material and the courses. Um, for me, I'm interested in sports medicine. Um, a lot of uh, holistic approach to it. Um, I like scopes, trauma, things like that. And so I catered my clerkship choosings to programs that kind of um, built a foundation around those areas. Kristen, I think you were next. So Venusha hit a lot of it. Um, there's like a kind of couple of ways of thinking about it, like she said, geographically. Um, but if I could just like, do it again I think I would I based a lot of my choosing based on you know I kind of fell into a certain group of people and then I wanted to follow what I thought you know were the top programs now top programs to one person can be a top like something that I ended up hating in something else um like because again what Venetia said is a lot of these programs focus on different things. One may just be solely on surgery while another one may be more well-rounded and have a good option of clinic and surgery. So coming in as an, like choosing Max, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to do sports medicine like V or if I wanted to do trauma. So unfortunately, like I, my opinion of a good program in my shoes kind of changed throughout. And unfortunately that was after I chose them. So the biggest thing I have to say is talk to multiple people, start your research first year, um, try and see like who you kind of seem like, uh, do you guys kind of like the same things? Are you in the same, like uh, what you idealize as a, uh, a good program? Because a good program that someone before me liked was definitely not a good program to me. And uh, it just will change and just be open for that change. Muhammad, I think you had something to add. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a, it's definitely a process. Um, like, um, I, I agree with Kristen, and uh, about it, you kind of know more after the fact. Uh, just my process for me was, um, you know, the first three years, two and a half, three years of school, I I built relationships with people uh, in my school upperclassmen. So you kind of know who's a go getter, who's someone who's very professional, and who's someone who you know, has the same ambitions as you. So I would get information from them about externships and uh, I would really use that to whittle down and choose which places I wanted to go. But then what Kristen was saying as well is when you you start on externships, you start to learn by yourself, like, oh, okay, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And you kind of evolve your process. And I think for me, this is an example. One thing I didn't, realized I, I was very important to me until I started externships was culture. Um, culture was just not something it, that crossed my mind as a second or third year student choosing externships. I just always thought of who has the, um, the best surgeries, uh, who has the, the best um, reputation um, geographically. Uh, that was very important for me because my family's all in the Northeast. Uh, but as I got in as an extern, it occurred to me that, you know, culture is very important. Um, because you're going to be spending basically every day with these people for three or four years. So that's something that I evolved as, as, as I went on. And it, it weighed more heavily in my decision going forward. Yeah, Elizabeth. I would say my methods of choosing my externship prior um, to like before the application and whatnot were really similar. I asked all my faculty and they said, ask the upperclassmen, the upperclassmen to ask the faculty. So um, what I actually ended up doing, it was kind of annoying, but I got the, the PDF list of Casper Crip and then I just started weeding out by geography. Um, and then by, it sounds really bad, but I'm really broke. So I also wanted to go to a program that didn't pay me like $20,000 a year for uh, 80 hours a week work. So I we didn't mount like by, by that. And I had a list of 60. And then from there, I think it was a, a piece of advice from my mentor. She's, she had an interesting point of choosing a place that has relatively good amounts of resident pro, residency programs nearby. So when you're there, you can email them out saying, hey, I'm in the area. Um, I'm only free during these days or these times. 
um, is it possible to talk to you or uh, come by and visit? So at least you give an effort saying you're kind of interested. So when it comes down to uh, interview applications, they recognize your name and you can say you reached out and you talked to such and such because during this time. So I thought that was pretty good advice. That's great. That's really helpful. So as a first year student or as an incoming first year student, do you all feel that your undergraduate coursework prepared you for your studies in podiatry school? Go ahead. Yes, Benicia. Um, so I think for me personally, I think it was a 50-50, depending on the courses that I chose to take, like to complete my degree in undergrad. But one thing to always keep in mind is um, for the students that are coming in, it, everyone's coming in with a different major. We had people in my class that history majors in undergrad that were, you know, geology majors, engineering majors, things of all different backgrounds. So you may not necessarily get the coursework that you need to feel like adequately prepared for med school, but everything you need to learn, you're going to learn during your time in school. Um, whether you've never been exposed to or you've been exposed to multiple times, like just have faith in the coursework and that your professors will guide you in the way that you need to because they've guided so many before you. So if you ever feel stuck or lost or you just are very scared coming in, you're seeing the courses that you're going to be taking and you're like, I know nothing about 90% of these courses, just give it time. You'll learn it as you go because you're all coming from different backgrounds. Some of you are very far removed from school. Um, some of you may have taken gap years and some of you may be going in right away um, after you graduated from undergrad. So you're all starting at different places, but you all end up in the same place. And I think that's something to kind of keep in mind because I know a lot of students in my class and the classes below us have stressed out about the fact that they don't feel prepared and they don't ever feel like they'll get to a point to being prepared because of their undergrad coursework. That's good. All right. So now to open it up to all of you, how do you guys bounce back from a poor exam score or an exam score that you weren't happy with? We'll start with Muhammad. I, I, I think for me, it was just, um, I just wanted to know whether I studied uh, efficiently and, and if I put in the work. Uh, so just for example, if, if um, let's say I, I studied every day, uh, a week leading up to an exam and I got a 95 and or I studied every day for an exam and I got a 70. For me, I wasn't so much caught up with the outcome as I was with, with the work I put into going into it. So if I if I know that I worked hard and I, and I, and I did my due diligence to be prepared for that exam, uh, whether or not I, I got the score I wanted wasn't important for me because uh, I, I couldn't, I don't, I don't think I could uh, control that aspect. But what I control is waking up early and studying and um, just the hard work. And as long as I did the hard work, I was always happy, no matter what the score was, to be quite honest. Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, I would probably do three assessments. I'll do a self-assessment, then I'll do an assessment of myself with a professor that probably graded or wrote some of the questions, and then also do an assessment with, um, at our school we have, um, a college or like a campus research that resource that helps academically they review your study tips they ask you questions they get into your psyche really good and then um <laughs> like yeah they made me cry um I was like, oh. so, but it was good it was a refreshing peel um to let you recognize what the studies of learning have said what the actual writers of the professor said and what your self-evaluation is of did i actually spend time or did i just go on youtube and look at cat videos you know <laughs> Yeah, Venetia. Um, and lastly, always make sure to go over and review the exam. Some teachers let you kind of like look at the uh, old exam. You can go back and see maybe why, like maybe you were just thinking of it differently, maybe you misunderstood the question and it was just an honest mistake. Maybe you didn't understand the material, you don't remember reviewing it. And then sometimes, at least at our school, our professors are pretty good at um, if they're noticing a student is struggling, but they're trying really hard, they may pair them up with someone who is doing um, well in the class. That way they have a kind of like a study buddy, especially in your first year and your first semester. You're still building those relationships. You don't know um, everyone and, you know, how you're going to foster your friendships and things like that. Um, everyone has their own agenda in terms of like they may have families and things. So the professors might even pair you up or even ask them like, hey, I seem to be struggling in this class. Is there anyone you could refer me to that may you know, want to help with me in tutoring or just to study with? And they'll usually have that student reach out to the person who's struggling um, to make kind of like a comfortable um, atmosphere. So always review your exam and ask your professor if there's anyone that can help you studying wise. So let's 
quickly switch topics briefly. Elizabeth, you mentioned this in terms of selecting an externship program and kind of picking one that maybe had a couple different residencies around it. So hinting off of that, how did you guys narrow down your top choices for residency? Was it based off of location or program type or near your externship? Uh, I guess I can start. Um, Go ahead. We'll start with Elizabeth and then Kristen. I wanted to feel somewhat empowered because everyone said they're judging you. And I'm like, well, I'm judging you too. <laughs> so I them on three criteria, social, academic, and geography. So socially, do I get along with them? Are these people that I can learn from? Do they teach me well? Do they have the same values of learning that I have? Academically, are they at a place where I want to be? Um, are they learning things that I want to learn? Um, and then geography, not just the weather, not just close proximity to friends or family, but again, I'm broke. So I'm like real estate market. How is the rent? How is, am I going to spend 80% of my rent and eating beans and, and uh, lentils every day? I don't know. So um, it's a tough life, but those are the three things that I measured and I graded it one through 10. And after every externship, I would just grade it. And at the very end, I'd say, oh, okay, these are the higher scores. So let me look more into these. Kristen, I think you were next. And then I think I saw Venetia raise her hand. Um, so narrowing down the externships after I've completed them, um, I think I took a huge look, a step back and look at um, my, A, my experience as a student, and then um be like kind of where I felt most comfortable um a big part for me is that I didn't want to go to a program that I felt like I didn't have the same either ambitions or personality as my co-residents because to me an ideal um residency is one where I hang out with my co-residents and we do things and we have each other's backs and now there's definitely programs out there where the residents come in do their work for themselves and then go home. But I know I'm the type of person that would love to, you know, like sit around with the other residents and say, oh, do you need me to go run up to the floor to do this? And I kind of wanted to make sure that my co-residents that are either in the grade, I mean, the years above me or even that are coming in with me um, had the same values as me. And so in order to figure that out, you really kind of have to see how they necessarily choose their residents. Now, do they choose their residents just solely based on GPA? Are they interviewing only people that have the highest GPA and then just choosing whoever chooses the highest score? Or are they really putting a huge emphasis on who either comes to the program or makes a, a valiant effort to visit for a day? Um, and are they choosing amongst people that, you know, they really feel like they mesh with? So to me, I, that was something that, again, going into choosing them, I had no idea that was something that I valued. But taking a step back and looking at it during and after that that's just um, a huge thing for me. Nisha, how about you? And then Mohammed. Liz and Kristen really hit up on a lot of the main points when everyone's kind of looking at residencies. Um, two things. One is very similar to what Kristen just said. For me, it was finding a family. Um, this is going to be your next three years. Some places it's four years and you know, you're not going to always have like, you know, your parents aren't going to always be around or near you. You may be in a completely new area. So this really is your backbone and foundation kind of for the next three years. And you want to make sure you can get along with everyone and you feel comfortable because you don't want to ever put yourself in an uncomfortable um, situation or position, um, especially when it's this important. Like this is your surgical career. You're, this is your clinical career. You're learning everything you're going to learn these next three years before you're out on your own doing anything that you want to do. Um, one other thing that it was actually during one of my first externships, a resident told me and he was like, make sure when you're out at your resident, like whether you like our program or not, when you're out on your clerkships and your externships, don't look at just what they're doing at the program. Look at what the graduates are doing now that they've graduated from the program. Look farther like you know did they get jobs coming out of it did they go to fellowships are they struggling right now are they unable to you know perform whatever tasks that you may want to be able to do because that's that's the training you're going to be getting is going to be very very similar if not the same to what they receive so kind of look farther and see what those residents are doing and how accomplished they are in the areas that maybe are important to you because you don't think about that during externships and i was with Kristen. there's some that i would have probably changed now like looking back and figuring out what I might have wanted more in programs or, you know, the opportunity to go see more, but really just 
look farther than those three years because that's what's going to be you in five years or 10 years from now. Mohammed, go ahead and then we'll swing back to Kristen. I mentioned it earlier about culture. I think culture is very important because you're going to be spending so much time with, it, with, with the residents and the attendings. Um, you'd be surprised how some programs that have a very good reputation um, can be difficult to work at. Um, so just be self-aware and just be self-aware of who you are and what are you comfortable with. Because I, I, I've also been to an actorship where it, it's a very high demand culture, um, but I like that, but some people don't. And that's fine. Just, just, just be honest with yourself. But I think another thing that's very important for me was um, we're all going to be very busy as residents, um, but I just wanted to make sure that my learning experience in the operating room um, was as best as possible. So I based um, my decision mostly on how much learning am I getting in the operating room and, and how much autonomy uh, am, am I getting there. Um, and those are my, my, my main two criteria. Kristen, we will end with you, go ahead. So similar to what V was saying about the third year residents finding a job, another huge thing that I realized kind of during and after my internships was looking at the attendings and seeing what their personality was like. Um, because a lot of times the attendings are the ones that have all the contacts. So if you have an attending who is very um, involved with research or really involved with their state organization or really involved just nationally, um, the amount of contacts that they have is, so awesome for a resident to benefit with. So if you say, oh, I want to go back here geographically, they'll be like, okay, let me reach out to so-and-so who I know. Um, and also the personality of the attending is going to be reflected on you because um, you are going to spend almost every day more time with these attendings than you are probably with your own family at some point. So to me, it was really important that my attendings had a very similar uh, belief in their values and worth eth work ethic that I want to carry because the last thing I want is to be taught by um, someone who has totally different belief like um, systems and think that it's um, lazy and whatever. So yes, that's just my two pieces of that. <laughs> You guys, that was really, really awesome. Thank you. This hour has flown by. I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Before I hand it back over to Abhinav, I wanted to share a quick poll, or at least try to. We'll see if this actually works. Hopefully now you all should see a poll on your screen. We'd like to host more of these in the future. So if you guys want to vote on what topic you would like to see discussed next, if you have other specific ideas, feel free to share them with me specifically. I'm happy to receive suggestions. Hopefully you guys would like to join us on one of these again in the future. And until then, I'm gonna hand it back over to Abhinav. All right, so I just wanted to thank everyone for their great questions and taking the time to join us for this afternoon's webinar. And a very special thank you to our excellent student panel and thank you all for your insight and advice. APMA is working to schedule another PodMed student webinar in the coming week, so stay tuned to your email and be sure to follow us on Instagram at official underscore APMA to stay up to date on all of our upcoming student activities. Until then, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Awesome. Thank you, Abhinav. Thanks to the panel. I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.